I'd like to uh, introduce John Pullinger, who I'm sure is known to uh, all of you here. He's the national statistician. John, um, over to you. Right, well, thank you, Guy, and um, thanks to the RSS for organising this. We suggested some months ago we might hold this, and I immediately said, yes, of course, I'll, I'll come and uh, uh, kick the proceedings, proceedings off. It's taken a little while to get it, get it together, but as it happens, we've probably picked the most timely moment to be having this debate here, with the, uh, which prices day to day, obviously, so a lot of discussion about petrol prices up and video games down, um, but also the House of Lords um, committee in the middle of an inquiry looking at uh, the RPI. Um, and uh, this is a great opportunity, I think, for the society to have a voice and also for um, various friends of the society to come together this evening and, uh, and share their views. So let me start um, following that. Thank you. Is this going to go? Yes, it is. So the first thing is, I mean, we are in ONS statisticians, and our role is to do statistics, and our role is not to tell people what to do with those statistics. Although inevitably, what we do and what we don't do um, creates the range of options from which people can choose when they are using those numbers. Um, and we are not saying which index should be used for what, which index is right for pensions, which index is right for um, bonds, which interest is right for, uh, index is right for interest rates. But we are here to think about what are the properties of different statistical estimators, how do we make them real, um, and how do we ensure that people understand what they're getting when they're using an index for a particular purpose. So the two critical things for me. Uh, the first is to listen. And uh, I've been in this role four years. Um, and before that, I was kind of on the other side of the fence here, also participating, speaking more than listening um, as RSS president on this subject. But in my role, coming in and listening. And I was extremely fortunate at the beginning of my tenure to be uh, working with Paul Johnson, who was doing a review for the UK Statistics Authority that was pretty comprehensive in its um, endeavour to um, find out the various viewpoints, the various possibilities, the various interests that people had got in this issue. Um, when Paul delivered his review, I then kind of boiled it down into what I concluded from that and again had a further consultation on how well we, how well that actually fit the bill and uh, uh, came up with some conclusions from that. And to help me take it forward, a very specific thing that uh, uh, I did was set up a, a stakeholder group, and it's nice to acknowledge Kate Barker here today, who's kindly been chairing that for several years now, trying to bring together the various interests to help us get it right. So, I mean, I'll talk a bit about the listening from that, but I suppose the, the first thing to note is different people have different views on prices. That's probably fair, Kate, is it? Uh, and uh, this is about trying to make some sense of that so we can move forward. So having done some listening, we then need to think, as, as statisticians, so what are the characteristics of different indices and how do they match up to those various um, aspirations? So again, just trying to engage the broadest range of technical experts that we can. So again, I established a technical panel that Nick Vaughan chairs, and again, many people um, here have been engaged with that, trying to look at the properties of different indices, different methods, different um, approaches that we can take and trying to find the best match between the stakeholder aspirations and how you might measure that. I spend a lot of time with my counterparts internationally looking at how other countries are moving in this space because prices are something that every country seeks to measure and there's particularly rich experience within the European Union on, on that and uh, how we can draw on what they have done and compare notes and get some kind of best practice into what we do here in the UK. And specifically, I think, on that, um, in terms of my own learning on this, um, uh, talking to John Astin and, and reading the paper that he and Jill Lanen put together, um, which really has made me think a little bit about different approaches to, to tackling this, this question. So that's where I came into it, um, and where did I come out of it? Well, what I heard was that people pretty much want to know three rather different things. So the first thing they want to know is how do prices impact on the economy? And we have a basket of indices, 
CPI, CPIH, um, that is based on economic principles, and straightforward, it looks at the prices of consuming different goods and services. So you can break things down, you can look at different pressures, you can also look at supply chains through the, the PPIs, input and output prices, through the industrial sector and how they flow into, into consumers. They're broken down, so largest amounts of consumption have bigger weights than smaller amounts of, of consumption. It's relatively straightforward. We follow very closely, the, the, we follow exactly the European standard and through the harmonised index of consumer prices. Um, we follow those methods. The one gap in the UK implementation of those methods was housing, which obviously is a pretty significant part of consumption. So after due consideration and uh, consultation, we've come up with CPH, which is our answer to that. Again, different people have different views, but certainly in our um, assessment, the approach we've taken, looking at the rental equivalents of owner-occupied housing, um, the rental equivalents method to proxy for owner-occupied housing is the best proxy, capturing um, the idea of consumption of housing services uh, better than others, but there are alternatives, but that's one we, we came up with. So that is our answer to how do prices impact on the economy. Second thing people want to know is how do prices impact on people? And so how is our experience of prices? And that's a different question to consumption. Because our experience of prices is going to be the cost of our student loan, the cost of servicing interest on our mortgages. Um, but it also enables us to break it down in a much different way. You treat each household with the same weight. Whereas an economic approach, more spending gets more weight. Well, if you think about households, we're all equal. We should all be equally represented. You can split it by different types of households. And crucially, and this is one of Paul Johnson's insights, you can compare it quite precisely to income and look at questions of inequality, looking at questions of, of living costs. Um, and you've got a, another rich set of complementary information to go alongside um, price pressures on economic principles. So we've now got an experimental version out on that. Um, we said we'd do it by the end of last year. We did it by the end of last year. The feedback I've received on that is, is very positive, and we have encouragement to move that forwards and get that into much more regular production, which we will do. Which then takes us to the third thing, which is the primary point of our discussion this evening, the RPI. And what I heard people saying is they want the RPI and they want us to keep the RPI. Because what it is, it's, it's an accumulated set of expectations and legal provisions that have grown over many years to meet a particular um, set of purposes. Now, I call it a legacy measure in this slide, and I will um, explain that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but because of the way it was put, the strong message I've got is don't fiddle around with it. Because if you fiddle around with it, you're going to change those expectations. People understand that it functions differently to CPI. It will function differently to the HCIs. Um, but we know that. And when we've entered into a contract, we have that factored into our calculation. And that's just how it is. So my listening says I have to consider that. And I have to consider if we do attempt to do anything with it, there's a whole set of expectations that have to be taken into account that have significant financial consequences for some party or the other. Um, so doing anything with that, um, if we were to do so, would need a great deal of care. But certainly our, the, what we have heard, and this is my listening, is we've got an accumulated set of expectations. We know what they are. We'd like you to keep that, even though you are telling us it's not a national statistic, you don't like it, and you've got some great things called CPI over here and HCI over there. We're in this thing and we're kind of stuck with it. So then what, is, what do I mean by this legacy thing? Uh, it's two parts to that, this question that I want to answer. The first one of why I don't think it's a good measure of inflation. And I'm on the record as saying that very straightforwardly and clearly. Um, um, but then, so what do we do? And I think that's going to be a significant part of this discussion tonight. So I'll unpack both of those. So why don't we think it is a good measure? Well, the key point for me is, is this incremental development over, over decades. So what we've got now is if you try and apply, we think about the RPI as a statistician, you're thinking, what is the conceptual coherence of this measure? 
Well, the CPI has been designed with that in mind. The HCI, HCI is being designed with that in mind. This doesn't really hit the spot for me as an economic measure, capturing consumption, nor as a household measure. It's got features of each. And that's because of this incremental development. And specifically, then, am I still on the right slide? Yes. Uh, there are four, four things I'd just like to say a little bit uh, about, which I'm sure we'll come back to. So the first one is this uh, Carly index as an elementary in index. So this is the first stage of the calculation, how you deal with the individual price quotes when they come in. Um, and... Uh, so again, you can argue for it, um, and you're making a judgment in the round here, but I observe that international partners have moved away from it because there are better alternatives. There are numerous recommendations for us to move away from it. Our own regulator, uh, Office of Statistics Regulation has said so, Consumer Price Advisory Committee has said so, Paul Johnson's review said so, my technical advisory committee is telling me so, UN guidance says so, and Carly is not the best approach. And I mean, I'll illustrate that with a little graph, but simply put before I go to the graph, is that it, it doesn't have a property that you would want in a good index of transitivity. If a price goes up, and then goes down by the same amount, it ought to come back to the place you started. And it doesn't. And that, to me, is pretty fatal. This is the illustration. So clothing has been the, 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 the kind of in the eye of this storm. Um, and you've got, how clear is it on the thing? It's pretty clear. So um, I think I've got to do that. So the, the, a group of clothing products, the dotted line, this is over an eight-year period, 2010 to 2018, looks at what you would expect the price movement to be from those products, so the same product over this, this period of time. The, what colour are they? Brownish dots are what Carly does to those prices, and the bluish dots are what Jevons, which is the preferred alternative formula, does. Now, the Jevons formula pretty accurately tracks it. There's slight differences in different areas, which may be down to all kinds of things to do with the particular quotes. But the Carly index systematically overestimates the amount of price change. And as you go into the higher prices, the, the, the worse it gets. That means it's just not a good index in practice. It doesn't have the properties that you would want, particularly for prices which go up and down a lot. But that is locked into the RPI. Any change to that would affect expectations of people who have seen that that is part of the properties of the RPI as we have very transparently and clearly defined it. So the second significant area of problem is how it deals with housing. And here it is a, a curious mixture, and I can see how it's happened. I mean, I was involved in, in, in price statistics calculation myself 20 years ago when some of these discussions were really just starting getting going. Um, and what it attempts to do is look at the kind of economic cost of, of using housing as an asset, which is conceptually not really either consumption or is it the payments. Um, but even if you put that to one side, which is a bit tricky for me because I like to go back to first principles and think, so what am I trying to measure here? Um, but even if you put that to one side, the practical implementation of that, the RPI, is problematic because what it seeks to do is proxy the full user cost, which should be how much you pay on your mortgage, plus interest you've forgotten because you're paying that on your, because you've, you've bought your house rather than put your money into, into savings and got interest on that, plus the depreciation of your house, plus the cost of running that house, um, less any capital gain you might get from it, is that's what it's conceptually seeking to measure. But what it actually does is it uses two sets of indicators for this. It takes mortgage interest repayments, so yeah, fair enough. Um, but given what it says it is, it's a bit dodgy because it confuses financing with price. Um, but OK, that's, that's at least clear. But the real problem is on, on depreciation, which is proxied by house prices. Now, that certainly in recent years has been a little bit strange. Um, because there's not really that link, because the cost of maintaining a home is just, it just isn't, hasn't been linked 
to property prices. It's got 8% weight in the whole of the RPI, so it's a big thing. Um, and also, again, conceptually, the house price includes the land, um, which doesn't depreciate, so it's a funny thing to put in for depreciation. So those are kind of historical things that have built up that may not have been problematic at a particular time. But in terms of the way this index behaves, they are now. Now, again, on the expectations front, people who work with these indices know that. They can model it. You can work out the, the wedge on all of these things, and Office of Budget Responsibility does that very precisely for budgets, and I'm sure other organisations that are using these indices um, in their own, in their own organisations are, are looking to think, so how will these things behave? So it's fine in that sense. But as a statistician, I find it, well, not the best. So then we go to the two other things, which are, are less critical, but um, are nonetheless relevant in terms of having a conceptually coherent thing. So the first is that the weights used in, thank you Guy, the weights used in the RPI are based on the living costs and food survey, um, and there are known issues with that survey, particularly for certain, certain products, that in the CPI we overcome by using national accounts estimates, which give you a fuller understanding of consumption. And also, much more prosaically, uh, it actually knocks off the top and the bottom of the, or certain bits of the top and the bottom of the distribution, the top 4% of earners, and the poorest pensioner household, so those people who are mainly dependent on the state, um, state benefits. And then finally, in this catalogue of woe, the data collection and classification, just the, the way the data is used for that, and there's a, a, a kind of non-standard um, process for that. So, OK, so that's, that's the case against the RPI. So why not fix it is the kind of obvious question. How can you possibly carry on doing this thing when you yourself are saying it's not a national statistic, you've got, it doesn't conform to statistical properties, you are the national statistician, and um, you shouldn't be doing something which you say nobody should use. Um, but... Then you, so, what's the question? So, what do we mean by fix it? And what is the concept we're actually trying to estimate from it? Because that's what I want to hang on. Um, and if you do fix it, where does that leave people who've built up expectations using the existing methods? So, what are we doing? So, one, we are discouraging its use, and I discourage its use tonight. There are far better alternatives on offer. Um, and we can discuss those with you. You can think about what they are and you can decide how best to proceed in that. But fundamentally, it is up to you. Nobody actually has to use the RPI. They're locked in to contracts. Um, but uh, it's up to each of you to work out or to explain, I suppose, in the first instance. And so areas like rail fares will be a, a very straightforward example of uh, uh, a need for explanation there. And the, the rail organisations have done. I mean, they're wanting extra money to put into investment, and that's perfectly honest and coherent. Um, but then the question comes, uh, what do I do? I know this isn't a good thing. It's several years now since Paul Johnson's review. This, the, 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 the kind of hope was with all this exaltation to move off it, people would have moved off it, off it by now. Uh, I think things are moving. But at the moment, I think my duty, given the feedback I've got from a whole range of users, is we've got this RPI, expectations are built up on the basis it continues, in some cases legal expectations. Um, and to change it requires me to act with care because I need to think about the consequences of that in terms of um, orderly business in, in a whole range of different organisations around, around the country. So I want to listen very carefully to the consequences of any action. But at the moment, two alternatives, one on economics, one on households, but people are saying, keep the RPI as it is, so my policy is to do just that. But if finally, as I finish up, to look to the future... Um, we are moving into the world of using scanner and transaction data and web scraped data. And the international experience, particularly from Australia and Netherlands, which are quite well advanced, is this isn't terribly problematic in the use of a, a Jevons uh, uh, or Duteau type index because they are pretty much unbiased estimators of the thing you want to get. So they have been able to put this in and get the immense richness of price information you get from these new sources and still get your aggregates coming out where you would expect them to do. So that's a great affirmation, again, of, of those, those methods. Um, but it doesn't work like that for the RPI. You end up with something which is, which is very, very different, and that will be, a, again, a significant change of expectations. We have a big work programme to try and improve all of these uh, 
all of our, our offering on prices. That's out there. You can look at it. Many of you are actively involved in helping us with that. I'm extremely grateful to, to everybody who's, who's doing that, particularly on my advisory committees. But across the piece, this is a big area of academic research now, which I, I celebrate. So I just finish really now by my gratitude to all of you who've helped us on this journey and my gratitude in advance for any thoughts and observations you've got this evening. So thank you very much. John was kind enough to thank me for chairing the stakeholder panel on consumer prices. And because I chair that, I'm not going to say anything very much about what I think about the RPI. I'm really going to try and describe what I see as a status quo model today. So, in the June 2010 budget statement, it said, the CPI provides a more appropriate measure of benefit and pension recipients' inflation experiences than RPI because it excludes the majority of housing costs faced by homeowners, and differences in calculation mean it may be considered a better representation of the way consumers change their consumption patterns in response to price changes. There was following that budget a court case from the public sector unions about the change to the indexation of their pension benefits. And in the judgment, a senior advisor to the DWP was quoted as saying, the CPI was more suitable than the RPI as a measure of inflation for benefit claimants as it excludes mortgage interest payments but includes all pensioner households. In May of this year, we had a white paper on defined benefit pensions in which the DWP dismissed the case for an RPI to CPI override, which could, by the way, reduce the overall DB pension deficit by up to 50% on the grounds that it would be a direct cost to members. They made no discussion in that document of suitability. Of course, the cases are different. The legislation for public sector pensions and benefits refers to the general level of prices whereas many company schemes explicitly state RPI, which means that there's a higher bar for the legality of a change. There's a very interesting discussion of the legal issues in the recent BT Pension Fund, and one of the factors with the, which the uh, judge took into account was the widespread use of the RPI. And in addition, he commented that there is a risk that if we uprate scheme pensions by reference to CPI, the pensions might fail to keep pace with the real increases in outgoings as experienced over that year. These are very different comments on the RPI and CPI. You will all know that in 2013, on indeed March 14th, the UKSA removed the national statistics designation for the RPI. The advice about not using the RPI clearly didn't make it to the Treasury because on March 20th, 2013, the introduction of help to buy in the budget included a wholly new use of the RPI to uprate the payments on the fee payable to government after five years. So I think there are now, you may say, so what? Consistency, after all, as we all know, is the hobgoblin of little minds, and I certainly have a little mind. Um, but I think there are some questions that arise from this. If the RPI was not viewed as only worth routine changes, would the impact on, of the change in clothing methods have been allowed to survive for the last eight years? Um, I feel that it can't be right that because it's already flawed, it can be allowed to become more flawed. Can it be right that uprating for DB pensioners depends on random wording in pensions deeds, which were often um, produced when there were no other consumer price measures available? And there's been some interesting work from Resolution suggesting that when companies have large deficits, they pay less to their younger employees, so intergenerational fairness comes into it. Outside the public sector, new uses of the RPI keep popping up. Um, charitable endowments often use it to judge how much they can pay out. I think this is pretty unsatisfactory. Recently, we've had some select committees. The government of the Bank of England talked about deliberate and carefully timed move away from RPI, and the Chancellor's commented that the direction of travel is away from RPI. But frankly, in my view, there is no coherent mechanism for considering the many issues from such a transition. There are a lot of issues, economic issues, fiscal issues, legal issues, issues about private contracts. I think we do need to move this issue forward, and we will only do it if a whole number of people, particularly the ONS and the government, and probably legal advisors, sit down and think coherently about what could be done to make this position better. Failing that, I suspect that this unsatisfactory and random distribution consequences will continue long after I've lost interest in it because I will be dead. Thank you. <laughs>
Just very quickly wanted to say that I'm not a statistician. I'm a journalist and an observer of current events, affairs. I'm also a friend of the ONS and of the Stats Authority. And friends show support in good times and bad. They also tell each other the truth. So here's the truth about the RPI in the public life. In the I have a lot of sympathy for the position the ONS finds itself in at the moment. In the statistical community, the management of ONS and uh, UXA deserve everyone's sympathy regarding the RPI. They weren't responsible for the pickle that we're in at the moment. But let's not min mince words, it's a right mess. RPI is enshrined in law. It's the only statistic that uh, the ONS has to, by law, produce. £400 billion of index-linked guilts are attached to RPI. It's the king of statistics. Everyone believes it doesn't give good results. Some people think it, it can be reformed easily. Some people think uh, more difficult. But it gives terrible results. And the official position since 2013 is that maintaining this terrible up, up, this terrible up rating index is just fine. It's actually what users want. It was very encouraging yesterday to hear Sir David Norgrove at the Lord's Economic Affairs Committee breaking that impasse and saying he didn't believe that the UK statistical community can continue muddling along until 2068, which is the point at which the last index link guilt, which is attached to RPI, matures at the moment before another 50-year one or 60-year one is issued. He said there was a need to look for a more fundamental set of changes and I support that wholeheartedly. Let's hope what the Lords do is, in their report, propose a workable solution which helps the ONS and the government move to a sensible solution. This is a choreographed dance where everyone, because they're in a pickle, gets prodded and pushed and hopefully can get to a better move forward. And I'd hope everyone in the statistical community will pull together to make that happen. But let me also say what will happen if this doesn't occur. The alternative. And as a, as a friend, I can describe the alternative if the delicate dance has two left feet. No one knows when, but I do know what will happen. At some point, the real users of the RPI, not the gnomes of Zurich who own index-linked bonds, but the people of this country, the 25 million taxpayers, all the citizens of this country who pay the interest, which is linked to a defective measure will get annoyed at some point. There'll be some event that will bring this to the wider public consciousness. I don't know when, but I do know it will happen. It will be a major national scandal. ONS and the UK Stats Authority will have zero defense against this because they've said, we know it's wrong, but we aren't going to do anything about it. Even though the law requires the board of the ONS to protect and safeguard the quality of official statistics. RPI, of course, is an official statistic and always will be so long as the ONS publishes it. Remember what happened to the parole board only recently when they had a similar case. One case came along, the consequences were enormous. The reputational risk of the ONS, UXA and the management, not necessarily the management today, but the management at the time is at stake. If we do nothing, history won't be, tied, won't be kind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my contribution addresses the political context and the formula debate in practice. The TUC call is for the formula to be done properly across all inflation measures, not just the RPI. I'm leaving, I'm leaving aside the other issues raised as almost red herrings in today's big picture. Politics by which I mean the not necessarily consistent preoccupations of finance ministries have loomed large throughout. The Boskin was, report was published in 1996, just before the US issued Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. The Maastricht Convergence Criteria next took debate to Europe. Austerity policies may be global, but the specifics of Chancellor Osborne's approach brought the formula action to the UK. Throughout, the concern has been with the upward bias of Carly, not a downward bias of Jevons. Outside the viewpoint of a finance ministry, others, not least trade unions, are more concerned with downward rather than upward bias. From the start, there have been shortcomings in the application of theory and empirical evidence. The Boskin report channels Erwin Dewert, who reported a US geometric, geometric measure some 0.47 percentage points below an arithmetic one. But this was a difference, not a bias. 
Dewart turned it into a bias through simply asserting substitution. I quote, as Pearson observed 100 years ago, consumers do purchase less in response to higher prices, i.e. substitution effects do exist. As far as I can judge, this was the main substance of the case against Carly. For the EU harmonisation process, an appeal to difference was not, not bias, was sufficient for a change away from Carly on the grounds of international comparability, but the process certainly reinforced the direction of travel. The ONS, of course, come back to the issue more than a decade later, when the clothing changes doubled the UK formula effect. Initially, the ONS asserted substitution, and attention was drawn to the now almost universal rejection of Carly. But the ONS also assessed evidence for substitution behaviours in reality, and concluded that the economic argument wasn't viable. But rather than reopen the formula debate, DWIRT was simply deployed to close it straight back down. In, in doing so, he conceded that his use of the economic argument had been a mistake, a non-trivial admission. But instead, we are asked to believe that the answer was right for the wrong reason. The right reason was, of course, the axiomatic argument. Plainly, there are situations when the Carly exaggerates price change. But just as with substitution, the fact that a mathematical result might exist doesn't mean it is the dominant factor in practice. There are also situations when Jevons is known to understate. Paul Johnson only imprecisely described the relation between variance and a reducing effect of Jevons. He does not mention that this was likely the critical factor in the, in the case of clothing ahead of 2009, and so the whole reason for the renewed formula debate. On this, John Pullinger's earlier chart is also silent. And frankly, it is also incorrect for the ONS to regard the mess that they have made collecting clothing prices as providing new knowledge about the formula effect in general. Now, this renewed debate about the RPI is very welcome, but there are still dangers that politics will dictate the approach going forwards. Last month's defined benefit white paper showed the government continuing to deploy inflation to political ends. So some private pension holders have also secured any RPI windfall along with index link guilt holders. Outside these important Tory constituencies, most of us youngsters pay RPI but receive CPI. Plainly, the statistical practices that permit these blatant abuses should no longer be tolerated. But any outrage should not blind us to the statistical issues in general and the very real possibility that the use of Jevons is causing CPI to understate inflation. And this, put the, and this puts the experts, John's numerous recommendations, under the spotlight as well. Everything learned over the past dec two decades should be put in the service of getting the right or at least the least wrong answer with scientific considerations ahead of policy ones. Specifically, in my view, Mark Courtney's work provides a way forwards. Substitution was only ever a partial economic argument. Courtney generalises to a full supply and demand framework that can be applied item by item. For those with longer memories, the same framework would have explained why the chain linking of national accounts confounded economists' expectations. There is now an opportunity to resolve the formula effect, the most important technical debate in inflation measurement. The TUC urges the ONS to take that opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I've got three points to make. Um, the ONS, the first one is about formula. The ONS thinks that Jevons is the one, uh, but does it give good results? And the answer is no. And I'll give you two examples. Firstly, what happened to the CPI's measurement of clothing before 2010 was terrible. Over two decades to 2011, clothing prices apparently more than halved when the CPI as a whole was up by more than a half. The CPI com clothing component was more wrong relative to aggregate CPI prior to 2010 than RPI clothing is now post-2010. And it was so for much longer and with a larger weight. So I would contend that Jevons caused more damage to the measurement of UK's clothing prices before 2010 than Carly has since. Well, the second piece of evidence I'd take is a, a casual look at the rates of clothing inflation in many European countries, which frankly are implausible. Over the last decade, Polish and Bulgarian aggregate CPIs showed almost identical growth, yet one has clothing falling by 37%, the other has it rising by 17%. Lithuania clothing fell by 12%, Estonian rose by 41%. 
The Irish numbers, if you look at them, are frankly extraordinary. These are divergent nonsense trends, despite using Jevons. But is Jevons blamed for these trends? No. So I'd say, why is Carly getting it now? To me, it's clear. It's the collection of the, 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 the price quotes for clothing, which is the problem, not the formula. There's also a bias in ONS thinking. I think ONS needs to appreciate that inflation is a latent variable and there are different uses and users of these indices. The true rate of inflation is unknown, yet ONS states stridently that the RPI is wrong and CPI is good. The evidence is, in contrast, that many people experience inflation closer to the RPI rate than the CPI rate. To me, it's as if the ONS now has blinkers on. It's a group of economists producing economic statistics for economists. Yet no one price index fulfills any one purpose perfectly, and no one index is perfect for all purposes. Household or pensioner experience of inflation is conceptually and numerically different to macroeconomic inflation. The differences in construction that John highlighted between RPI and CPI are not, as ONS says, problems to resolve, but they've evolved over time. They're there by design, and I believe they are justified. My third point is about politics and independence. The bank and the treasury are too, dominated in, uh, are too dominant in the tripartite group and the stakeholder panel meetings. And the evidence given yesterday at the House of Lords Committee is pretty clear that statisticians are petrified of touching RPI for fear of, of fiscal costs linked to redeemable uh, index-linked guilt. But I think that UXA shouldn't be doing politics. And I'd like to paraphrase Chris Giles from his evidence yesterday, which is that statisticians should do the statistics and politicians should be left to redistribute public funds. So the ONS needs to produce the RPI and produce fit-for-purpose official statistics and not worry about the guilt market. Looking to the future, I think we need the ONS to do two things. One is to prioritise and continue the research it started into the collection of clothing prices and, where necessary, change how it's done. I'd welcome them starting with the famous strappy tops, this is uh, one thirtieth of one percent of the RPI, despite the, uh, the, uh, the prominence given to the story. Uh, secondly, I think there should be published a consumer prices development plan, which is produced in the open. This would be modest evolution, small incremental iterations run alongside many other changes. This means that the public and financial markets will know what's coming, the bank will not call any such fundamental, any such change fundamental or materially detrimental. The chancellor won't have to veto the change. And even if he does, there's only three stocks he'd have to uh, redeem. And no one who holds them in their right mind would do so because the market price is higher. Will there be an adverse financial market reaction to this that the ONS is so afraid of? Nothing of note, I'd say. And that's based on over a decade working for a gilt edge market maker. So I would set the UXA the very simple challenge of producing the three families of indices that John mentioned and making them fit for purpose and doing so within five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to address the meeting as well. I'm partner at Lane, Clark & Peacock. We're a specialist pensions consulting firm who advise around 40% of the FTSE 100 on their, on their pension schemes. I'm, I'm an actuary. I don't know if I can say that here, but I am. You have to forgive me. Um, there are 6,000 UK private sector pension schemes with liabilities of some £2 trillion. I'd like to make six quick points and then a call for action. Point number one, this is a big issue for pensions. We've heard it repeatedly today. For example, and only by way of example, if pension schemes were to switch from RPI measures to CPI-type measures for uh, their future pension increases, the impact would be at least £100 billion. Pounds. Number two, this is a long, long, long-term issue for pensions, even long-term when it comes to economists. Uh, pension schemes will be paying their pensions for 
80, perhaps 100 years from now, the pensions that have been promised. We are very interested not just in the next year or three years or five, but what are the plans for RPI for the next 50 or 60? Number three, an obvious statement but worth making. This is real money for real people. It impacts real pensions, millions of people out there who depend on their pensions. Obvious, but it's worth saying, 1% difference in an inflation index over 30 years of a retirement means a 30% difference in someone's pension. You can look at that in two ways. We've heard both argue tonight. Some will argue uh, that any change in RPI, there you know, must be no change to RPI because clearly that will worsen people's benefits. Other people will argue that clearly there must be changes to RPI because clearly people are being overpaid. And you can argue it both ways, but clearly it is a very sensitive issue and indeed a political issue as much as anything else. Number four, pension schemes are some of the largest owners of index-linked gilts. Key issue when it comes to inflation, as you know. Number five, I'll use a word that was used earlier by another speaker, it's a mess. It's a legal lottery for pension schemes. Um, this creates conflict, it can creates confusion on a day-to-day -day basis between trustees, employers, uh, employee representative groups, unions, etc. It creates frictional costs, lawyers, court cases, um, and inconsistencies between pension schemes down to the most bizarre little wording that some lawyer wrote 50 or 100 years ago in a pension scheme and no one really knew what it was at the time. Point number six, um, just report this meeting, in my experience, the employers that I advise are very interested in this debate. They track what is said in Lord's uh, committee meetings. They track uh, what is written and published uh, by the ONS. Every word is hung over with some employers. It really matters. This is, this is big money and a big issue. So a quick call for action. Number one, I know you won't, but as statisticians, please don't forget pensions. Uh, please involve experts in any decisions that are made at ONS and in broader committee context. I mean, real pensions experts are on the coalface, pensions lawyers uh, and actuaries who, who know what actual pension schemes do and, and, and the rules. Little tiny wording changes, something being a replacement index or an alternative or all of that really, really matters, as you probably are aware. Secondly, and finally, a call for a clear roadmap, and we've had it from a couple of people. I know there won't be a roadmap for the next year or five years, but for the next 10, 20, 30 years, where are we heading? Employers need to plan, trustees need to plan. We need to work out, are we taking each other to court or not, uh, for example? Can we have, please, a clear roadmap for the future of these indices, the long-term future? Because at the moment we react to what we're told, it develops very slowly, and we don't really have a sense of a direction of travel. Thank you. Thank you. Before starting, let me make one thing clear. Sometimes I speak on these matters on behalf of the Royal Statistical Society, but today I'm just setting simply my own thoughts out. I want to say first, then, I fully support the three approaches that John Pullinger set out for the macroeconomic household and RPI's legacy. But like other speakers, I cannot support the idea that we just leave the RPI to be effectively frozen. It is a mess indeed, as has been said. And I think it's particularly adverse for pension funds who do, as Jonathan Camfeld said, find themselves in effectively a legal lottery. And it's quite inequitable, I think, that the ONS and the UKSA should leave them in this state. What's the solution? I do not think it is a blanket change to CPI or CPIH. CPI is the EU's harmonised index of consumer prices, or HICP for the UK, and CPIH is the same with a couple of additions. HICPs were not drawn up with the intention of measuring the impact of inflation on individual households as the RPI primarily was, but for international comparisons and other purposes, they fit John's first use case. And as a result, their construction differs in a number of aspects from an index designed for the sort of purposes for which RPI was. And of course, they do use Jevons heavily, and we've also heard that that can 
underestimate in certain cases. The household costs indices should be a solution in the longer term, and I hope they will be, but they are only partially developed as yet, and they are certainly unproven. So the solution is to mend RPI. And what needs to change? I do find one of the disheartening things about this debate is to hear RPI criticised for elements in it that are actually logical or advantages given its prime purpose. In my view, the, the, for example, the exclusion of the top 4% of income earners and pensioners reliant mainly on state benefits were deliberate decisions taken to make it suit its purpose better. And its treatment of owner-occupied housing, although it may not fit a theoretical concept, is actually a lot closer to what households actually spend their money on. There does seem sometimes to be a mindset to say that if something in RPI differs from CPI or CPIH, or it doesn't adhere to economic principles, then it is wrong. But in fact, often when RPI and CPI differ, it's because they are following their different purposes. And as to economic principles, they can often be very useful in certain cases, but they are not the holy grail and not appropriate for everything. In my view, before 2010, the RPI was a perfectly good index. Not perfect, but no index is. And I think what is needed is to sort out the problem caused, particularly post-2010, by the combination of the Carly Index with current clothing prices, which does, I don't think you can deny, does lead the RPI to overestimate to some extent. And I emphasize the word combination. Any index number, Jevons, Carly, Duteau, will misbehave if applied to certain price sets, particularly when they give prices that jump around. Research is underway, but again, it's going to, to improve clothing, the, the collection of clothing prices and the, and the treatment of clothing prices, but it will take time. So don't roll out simple changes. You only have to, as far as I'm aware, it's only RPI itself that are used, or RPIX possibly, that are used. Not the, com um, the component series are only used for analysis and forecasting. One solution suggested in 2012 by Irving Dewitt was simply to take out fast fashion moving clothing. If you can have CPI without owner-occupied housing, would RPI really be so bad without fast moving clothing? Or at least only keep in non-fashion items? Or indeed, in this instance, just for the sort of fast moving fashion clothing, then replace the um, Carly by Jevons just in that limited case. But make the change limited in scope, signal it well in advance, and explain it well, so that guilt markets and other users were not taken by surprise, as they were in 2012, um, with a proposal that looked as if the um, ONS was going to make a more radical change than was actually needed. There may well be better solutions, but the important thing is to make the RPI acceptable again I do not think you can leave it as it is. Thank you very much. My first job after I graduated was looking after the cost of living index in Malawi, and we had a lot of problems there with clothing because batches of clothing would be imported from South Africa. You would have those in the shops for a few months, then they'd disappear. You might have a month or two months without being able to find the item at all, and then you would get a new batch. And it was clear to me that the way this was handled was probably putting a downward bias in the index index, essentially no change was assumed no, when the clothes weren't available and no change was assumed when, the clo when similar items reappeared, whereas in fact they might have been sold at a higher price. As I understood the problems with the clothing index before 2010, they came, if I understood it correctly, from the same sort of issue, seasonal items and people no, not correctly allowing for changes in price between the seasons. And that may well explain the very sharp variations in clothing price movements that uh, we saw in the list of countries that Simon Briscoe described. But uh, to my mind, the Carly measure is a source of 
pr no, and the price bounce that it gives rise to is a factor behind the upward bias in the retail price index. And of course, this matters partly because it went up from 0.3 to 0.7% as a result of uh, CPAC's uh, no, suggestions that clothing measures could be improved, that more clothing prices could be collected. The cost of that to the taxpayer, the windfall gain it's created for the purchases for the owners of indexed stock issued before this increase in the wedge occurred is roughly £1 billion a year. It may be a bit more than that, but uh, it's certainly quite a lot of money that all of, this, all of us in this room are paying for. So, and, of course, the RPI is popular where people can see it as a means of extracting extra revenue. So how do we get to a situation where statistics mean what they say and aren't a sort of tool in a Colbertian approach to taxation, hoping to pluck as many feathers as you can without the goose squawking? First of all, I must say I think the government shouldn't be a party to new arrangements which rely on RPI. Secondly, we have to have some sort of market established in CPI-linked debt. And thirdly, the government has to address the issues that uh, move it, doing away with RPI would give rise to for the indexed market. And finally, of course, because the ONS is obliged by law to produce the RPI, the, R the law should change. But what should we do with consumer prices more generally? For me, the most interesting aspect of the debate generated by Paul Johnson's review has been the focus it uh, gave to democratic price indices. It's often suggested that conventional plutocratic indices are needed for purposes of macroeconomic management, while the democratic price index might be more suitable to indicating the effects of prices on society. I must say that while I was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, we never had any discussion on the merits of plutocratic versus democratic price indices, but uh, in fact, at least in some parts of the modelling structure that the Bank of England uses, I'm quite sure that it would work better if democratic rather than plutocratic price indices were used. You actually need that for the model of consumption change that uh, is typically used to work effectively. Uh, <coughs> so, no, I think that if one were to uh, no, look more at that, we would see wider uses for democratic indices. Now, separately, my own work for the Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence has shown the link between democratic indices and welfare indices Indicators. No, on the other hand, we would still need a plutocratic index as a measure of the consumer, as a, in order to work out the consumer expenditure deflator so that we could calculate real GDP. The ONS has, of course, adopted democratic weights in the development of its household cost indices, but it's done so without thinking of a coherent framework of democratic quantity and price measures. The growth in a democratic price index is the average of each household's experience of price increases. The quantity counterpart, a democratic measure of real growth, is given by deflating the growth of the ge geometric mean of money incomes by the growth in, democratic pr in the democratic price index. Wouldn't it be a good idea if the ONS produced a measure of living standards which gave equal weight, equal importance to every household in the land? My own view is that we need a wide discussion of these sorts of issues. The household cost indices can't really be the whole of the answer, but at least putting the RPI out of its misery would generate the space for price and quantity data that meet the real needs of society. Thank you. So, uh, I'm an economist, and uh, I've only got three minutes, so I can only really make one point. So, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak briefly. Um, so economics has developed a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for a proposed index to be a valid price or cost index, developed over a long time. The Carley formula, uh, taking the average of price relatives, does not satisfy these properties. And uh, the issues of transitivity and price, price bounce that were previously uh, discussed uh, reflect that. Hence, for me, as an economist, it cannot be... Uh, a valid price index and cannot be a valid, ma valid measure either of the price level or of inflation. To me, the formula effect reflects a mismeasurement 
uh, of inflation. Um, the other two common indices that are used, uh, of course there are many, the Duto and Jevons, these are both consistent with economic theory. Uh, they essentially take the average price at a month relative to the average base price, the Duto being the arithmetic average, Jevons being geometric. There are, of course, other indices uh, that, are, that are valid price indices. Uh, i just say one thing, there is a sort of false idea going around that, in fact, the, the Carly cat does, in fact, uh, reflect uh, a, a certain class of preferences, Leontief preferences, uh, but, but this isn't uh, correct. So one can't blame poor old Giovanni Carli, who was writing in 1764, for doing this. The understanding of price uh, and cost indices was only really fully developed by economists in the mid-20th century. However, this understanding of price indices has led to a shift away from the use of Carly that uh, John mentioned by most NSIs around the world, from Jevons to Duto. So uh, what do I propose to do with the RPI? I've only got one idea, so here it is. What I propose is that the RPI be updated to remove this mismeasurement, and this is easily done simply by replacing the Carly formula for calculating elementary indices with a Jevons or Duto formula. This has been done already. The RPIJ measure, which some of you will be familiar with, was published by the ONS as a bit of a groundhog day. This was all discussed back in 2013. I think some of the people here were all doing that. And uh, uh, it, was, it was done. Uh, and it was published until January 2007 uh, when it was stopped. Not, not quite clear why it was stopped, but this can certainly be implemented as a new formula for the RPI going forward, leaving the historic RPI data at the same uh, for practical reasons, although you can have a back series of, of RPIJ for use by academics and others. RPI has been subject to many changes since it was introduced. Uh, the change is long overdue and should, I think, have been made in 2013, who, as some of the people here argue for at the time. Um, there are going to be winners and losers from this, but I think that the argument comes down to scientific uh, issue, for me anyway. Uh, there are now better measures of inflation, such as CPI, CPH, and HCI. But even as a legacy statistic, RPI should be made into a valid measure of the price level and inflation. The fact that some groups gain from this mismeasurement, in my view, of inflation, is not a reason why the ONS should continue in its mismeasurement. I'm speaking on behalf of the trade union, Unison. And as a union, we obviously come at this issue with a particular interest in the impact of inflation measurement on pay bargaining. So you may understand the scepticism with which we have always treated the emergence of a supposedly fatal flaw in the RPI after around 60 years of RPI as the virtually unchallenged reference point for pay bargaining in the UK. After all, the decisions by the ONS to downgrade the status of RPI and designate CPIH as the most comprehensive measure has been to provide ammunition for some employers in seeking, to considerably, in seeking a considerably lower reference point for pay, pay bargaining, worth about £350 a year to the average full-time UK worker. We would, of course, have to set aside our dislike of the impacts if the attacks on RPI were incontestable, but our belief is that they have never found convincing grounds. First of all, we were told that CPI-based measures were better because they accounted for consumer substitution. However, since it is not possible to determine with, with sufficient accuracy the level of substitution for particular items, our understanding is that it is not generally possible to determine whether CPI or RPI measurement methods should apply, and so there is no basis for using such an argument to favour either approach. <coughs> Secondly, much was made of the idea that RPI was guilty of significant exaggeration through price bounce, yet empirical evidence then emerged that any such effect was much less than 0.1 percentage points per annum. And the justification now appears to have taken refuge in the idea that CPI-based approaches are international best practice. We believe that this is a conflation of best practice with common practice, and it is apparent that the conversion to CPI methods in such countries as Australia and the USA was based on the now discredited consumer substitution argument. <coughs> 
Unison believes that the way forward for the RPI is what should have happened when the ONS originally made changes in the methodology for sampling of clothing. Rather than use the spe this specific scenario where RPI methods became inappropriate as a general attack on RPI in its entirety, the ONS should have adjusted toward use of a geometric mean in this specific category of goods. Having made such an adjustment, RPI should have its status restored as a national statistic alongside the ONS's duty to maintain RPI as the most accurate measure possible. But instead, the ONS has pursued a groundless attack on RPI and delivered a gift for employers at the expense of workers. Hello, I'm Sean Richards. Um, I work as not yes man's economics and I'm an economist. Um, I've got some numbers for you this evening. Most of you have given um, ideas. But I'd like you to think, please, once I've finished the numbers that I come out with. And what I'm talking about here is the crucial sector of owner-occupied housing. A few months ago, uh, the Governor of the Bank of England said there were known errors with the RPI. I contacted him to say that it's very disturbing to talk of known errors when by he has a targeted inflation measure that's risen by 7% at that time in his term, and yet house prices have gone up 29%. So there's an obvious gap there, isn't there, and an issue for people to face. One of the strengths where I differ from what John has said earlier of the RPI is that it does take the owner-occupied housing sector. Admittedly, it gets house prices by a convoluted route of depreciation, but it is 8.3% of the index via that route. CPI has nothing. If we move to a more modern version, some of you may not have heard of, I'm one of the few followers of it, CPI net acquisitions, which is the new attempt to cover house prices, that only has a weighting of 6.8%. So the 8.3% shrunk a bit, hasn't it? And the RPI has 2.4% for mortgage interest rates as well. So 107 if you put the lot in. And then suddenly it's 68 as I said, please remember the numbers. If we now switch from that to the preferred version that John has talked of earlier, we then come to an issue whereby you cover owner-occupied housing by imputed rents. These don't exist. They're an actual fantasy that's supposed to cover what an owner-occupier would rent their house out for, which they don't. And there's a further problem here that there have been a lot of issues with how rents are actually measured in the UK. So this is like a fantasy squared. But I did ask you to remember the numbers, didn't I? Because the weighting's now 16.8%. So that same housing sector we've got, has it doubled? Has it? Has it done a bit more than doubled compared to the net acquisitions method? One way of looking at this that I quite like is, the argument is, um, that I think Martin referred to earlier, that you can't take a price rise on the land. Okay, fair enough. But apparently you can take the rent on it, as the weighting numbers I've just given you show. Just to give you another example of how these weights can be unstable, People look at rents for people that do rent. If you look at the weighting for that, last year, 2017, it was 5.6%. This year, it's 6.9%. How's that stable? Does anyone think 23% more people rented last year? And so this poses a lot of deep questions. This, this was the point um, I raised to the Office of Statistics Regulation, actually, on the issue. Moving on from that, there are ways of taking this forward. I think John Astin and Jill are here. They've made a suggestion of what we can move forward. But I have another number to put in your mind. When the Bank of England went out and asked people last week what they thought inflation was, the reply was 3.1%. By far the nearest number to that is the retail price index, 3.3%. Now in an era of fake news, I'm not telling you that something's right just because people think it, but I am telling you that you need a very, very good reason to move away from it, in my opinion. And so far, I haven't seen it. Thank you. I'm Bill Wells. I, I've been associated with the RPI and wages for about 35 years. And I think I'd like to make two points. One about what uh, ONS and the Stats Authority can tell the government. And the second is... Um, whatever happened to the measurement of inflation. Um, on the first point, I, I was a bit surprised um, to hear that um, ONS and the Stats Authority didn't tell people 
what to do. For example, on the labour market framework, um, we had a long debate. Um, we were not very far apart, uh, but we had a long debate. So my suggestion in that area is that either the Stats Authority or the ONS becomes more like the LPC, where you have advice and an explanation for the government to, if they don't take the advice. Um, and you have someone at the head of the Stats Authority who knows the intricacies of that. Um, on the inflation side itself, I am completely bemused. I thought we were measuring inflation, the change in prices and not consumption or expenditure. And in order to achieve that, um, whether it's the will review or RPIAC that I've been involved in, that means you try to get rid of the quantity changes, which is Carly, you know. And clothing is the equivalent to me of seasonable red vegetables when they used to be seasonal. It's just that you actually have to get the chain linking such that you don't get any quantity adjustments in your inflation measure. So I've never really understood why we've become European when I've been sent to Europe to say, no, um, the CPI is not a measure of inflation and it's um, a, a harmonised measure of something vague. Thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Tony Cox. I chair the RPI CPI user group and we've had an active interest in, in this subject as a group for the last uh, eight or nine years or so. Um, I wanted to pick up on the point that John started off by making in his presentation when he talked about the two different categories of inflation index, uh, that for macroeconomic purposes and that for household uh, measurement purposes. I think that's a very important distinction and it's a point that the user group has made almost throughout its existence, I think. And on the macroeconomic side, we're very well served. We've got the CPI and the CPIH, uh, although I know there are some um, slight points about both of those in that context as well. But nevertheless, that's ba they're basically macroeconomic indices. On the, um, uh, on the household inflation side, we're not so well served. Um, we had the RPI that basically fulfilled that function, and the ONS is now doing work to develop a new index, the Household Costs Index, uh, work that we applaud. But at the moment, it doesn't exist. So we are left with the RPI, which is in effect used as the household measure of inflation. So the plea from the user group is not to freeze the RPI, but to continue work on it and improve it where it needs improvement. I mean, it's a call that um, a number of the other speakers have made. The clothing problem could be sorted. It's a problem with the combination of the formula and the way the data is collected. So it is a solvable problem, as others have said, and it should be sorted. And, the, and other issues should be sorted in the same way. It certainly should not be frozen, as is the current situation. Uh, my final point is that um, a lot's been made about the... Um, the Carly and the way that it distorts the, um, the, the final index figure. Uh, less emphasis is made on the way the Jevons uh, distorts the, the figures as well. But there's a lot of evidence that Jevons does underestimate inflation when it's used exclusively. And unfortunately, in CPI and CPIH, it is used virtually exclusively. Where we don't have weight information, the formula that's used is almost, uh, I think it's 95%, is, is, is the Jevons formula. Jute is used a trivial amount. Whereas at least in the RPI, it's a more even split between the Carly and the Juto. And I think many people would say, why not involve all three um, formula and use them appropriately um, uh, in terms of the data that they're measuring. So those are the points I wanted to make this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's John Astin, and uh, I started off in price statistics when I was leading the team in Luxembourg developing the harmonised index of consumer prices, which in the UK is known as the CPI, but the, throughout the rest of, the Euro of Europe, <coughs> excuse me, it's the HICP. Um, that's just by way of introduction. I've only got a very small amount to say, 
And that is, I think we're all agreed that the current problem with the RPI is a mess. What we don't know is how to sort out the mess. And mention has already been made of Chris Giles's comment yesterday at the House of Lords committee that ONS do the statistics, the politicians do the politics. Now, in John's uh, presentation, I think it was the first slide, in fact, I think it was the first row, it said it is not the, N it is not the ONS's role to prescribe uses of indices. Now, I have a bit of a problem with that, John, because uh, it depends what you mean by prescribe. Um, that has an element of force. You know, in other words, you must use these figures in such and such a way. <clears throat> and I wouldn't certainly go as far as to say ONS should do that. But on the other hand, you are negatively doing it with the RPI, saying you, you really should not be using the RPI. And it's a bit like a GP, you know. You, the GP prescribes medications. Uh, I know quite a lot of people, particularly elderly people, who, who get the drugs and don't take them or they don't take them in the quantity that the GP asks. Well, that's up to them. But the GP is the expert. He sh is supposed to know what is the thing to prescribe and how much of it, and what not to do. The doctor also tells you not to eat too many fatty products, etc., etc. Sorry, 30 seconds. I'm finished, almost. Um, so uh, I, I really feel that it, the ONS the experts in all of this. They know these figures. They know everything about the various indices. Why can't they say which indices should be used and for which purpose? Simon Briscoe used the expression fit for purpose. Gosh, we should all produce figures that are fit for purpose, but we've got to know what the purpose is. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's James Wintle. I work for uh, Willis Towers Watson, but the comments tonight are my own. Uh, I'm another pensions actuary, so I'll, I'll apologise for that before talking amongst you all this evening. Um, and and I, was, I was called to, to speak after hearing the debate tonight, and there's been a lot of complicated things have been kicked around. We've heard a lot of statistics, we've heard a lot of figures, we've heard a lot of economic theory. But I think there's a danger with all that, that we potentially lose sight of the big picture. So what I thought it might be helpful to do is to try and bring our focus back to a few things that I think most of us can agree on. And I think they're this. Uh, we've got a mess at the moment in the way we look after our inflation statistics in the UK. Something's wrong and we need to do something about it. Secondly, the ONS has got a statutory duty to maintain and publish RPI and give it care and attention and make sure it's a good statistic. And thirdly, RPI is incredibly widely used and embedded in a lot of financial contracts, whether that's pension schemes, whether that's index-linked gilts, whether that's other, other, other types of contracts. So it's a very important figure. So with those things that I think we can agree on, I'd just like to disagree with a couple of the things that John Pullinger said right at the beginning. Uh, in particular, the fact that he thinks that people are moving away from, G from using RPI and, and that this isn't going to be a problem in, in future. Well, I, I don't think that is true. I don't think people are moving away from RPI and in some cases cannot move away from RPI, at least not quickly enough or soon enough or speedily enough. So, to cut him a little bit of slack, I'd like to say something else that I think I do agree with John about, which is that it is very important that in making changes to any of these statistics, you do take extreme care. And you do need to think about what the financial implications of that are, and you do need to tread carefully. Absolutely right, I get that. But I think there's a corollary of that, which is not making a change also needs to be considered very, very carefully. And there are just as many financial implications of not making changes when you should as making them. So. Given the statutory duty for ONS to uh, look after RPI and, and ensure it's a good figure, uh, it has evolved in the past. I believe it should evolve in the future. Can the ONS really sleep at night without making the changes that some of us think are really needed now? Thank you very much. Well, what a discussion. That's um, been a, a huge amount of contributions from everybody. So, uh, first of all, I thank you for that. I've got probably four or five things that I've written down. I don't know whether I'll quite get to four or five, but let me start. I mean, the first one, 
I think I'll start with, so what is ONS's job in all this? And I mean, Bill's point about can be more like the low pay commission. I really would hesitate to do that um, because I think in pretty much every case, reasonable people can differ as to what the right thing actually to do is. So let's just put, this, put the RPI slightly to one side for a minute. If we have a well-respected and understood measure of inflation on economic measures, economic basis, and a well-respected measure on a household basis, I think then there is a very fruitful and active discussion between employers and employees, the government and um, other organisations, as to which is the right to use. And those opinions will differ. So I think my duty is to inform that debate so that the different arguments can be put and people be accountable for the choices they make. I think if I start telling them this is a choice you should make, I think I'm going a little bit too far. So that's, that's the way I interpret my remit. And what we're saying about the RPI is slightly different. It's got a category difference because we're saying it doesn't actually capture either of those two things which people want at the moment. So my first point is that bit about what our job is. But again, to pick up Bill's point, I'm... I'm really not interested in a harmonised measure of something vague. Um, and what I've sought to do throughout all of this is really bring a bit of precision to the, to the thinking that we adopt here. Now, what I've heard, I think, is, is a fairly good recognition, I think it's probably the best word, of the three use cases. So ONS really does, does need to focus on getting a good economic measure of inflation. It does need to focus on getting a good household measure of inflation. Um, and it does need to uh, continue to recognise that RPI is not a good measure of either. And the views I've he heard here are from a kind of at um, uh, one end of the spectrum, Martin's point of how can we humanely put it out of its misery through to a point that um, others made. And I think that... Uh, it was Tony towards the end who just talked very eloquently about the sorts of things you might do to, to fix it. Um, but I, so, so my, my point is there, I think there is kind of a recognition of the broad approach that we've taken. So, I mean, let's, let's park the um, CPI and the HCI thing for a minute and come back to the RPI. I mean, I was uh, grateful in James's passionate but well thought through remarks right at the very end there of uh, taking extreme care um, and a lot of people talked about that. I mean, I, um, Jill talked about not taking people by surprise. Uh, Chris had this choreographed dance uh, idea, which uh, I can see. Uh, but Kate started with a co coherent mechanism, something that actually enables us to do this, that recognises, which is the core of my argument about the expectations that are built into so many things at the moment, that. Um, uh, an unthoughtful action would have consequences that um, may not be what we want. We don't like what we've got at the moment. We've talked about the lottery and the pension funds, just in how the, the rules were, were written. But um, this concept of doing something choreographed or, or coherent to think about how we get from here to somewhere better, and it certainly came out very strongly in the evidence that various people gave to the um, select committee yesterday, including David Norgrove and Jonathan, Jonathan Ethel. Um, it's how we choreograph this and how we work with all the parties that have actually got an interest to make sure those interests are, are recognised and understood. Because we don't want to be where we are now in the long term. So that's really my second point. Um, and my third point is, is really the statistical point um, that several people talked about, just well, <laughs> make sure you do it properly. And um, I just say here, here to that. And I, that I heard a lot of people talk about both a theoretical perspective and a practical perspective there. Uh, I think Jeff was the first one to, to, to introduce it. Um, I think we do need to be very rigorous about thinking about what these formulae do. And if some overstate, we need to demonstrate those properties. If some understate, we need to demonstrate those properties. We need to justify what we're doing about um, biases in that and do that in a proper scientific statistical way. And with the help of fellows of this society and many others, I hope we will do that. 
several people referenced the research program that we've got. There's quite a bit of that kind of thing in there. Help us get that right, because it serves no one if we're having arguments about what these things actually do, um, and particularly people who are not experts. It's bemusing for us to be kind of saying, well, you've got to work out, so what is this Jevons and what is this Carly? We should be saying these, these indices have these properties, and this is why they are either good or not good proxies for what we're trying to, to measure. So I think this kind of theoretical point is, needs to be a key part of our research agenda. We've tried to shape it with the issues and the priorities that we've heard from you. We've heard more today, and we will look at how we take that on. So help us with that, and certainly help my technical advisory panel um, to, to pick that up. So it's kind of a theoretical point, but there's also a practical point. Um, and, uh, well, Sean talked about the weights, and I thought there was some uh, well-put points there. Uh, Jill talked about the way some of the proxies, some of them might sound like they're not very good, but actually if they are, well, that's fine. Again, I think we need to be rigorous with ourselves about that. Some of these things require proxies because you haven't got anything else to, to rest on. Um, but just be honest and, and say that. I think we need to do that. I hope we do. But again, the way we describe what we're doing, I think, is very, very important um, and pick up very practical points, I mean, Sean's points about weights, weights I, I've exampled. And certainly, um, Kevin's point about don't rest on discredited arguments. You have to keep revisiting these arguments. The idea of price is changing very rapidly around us by the, the, the just kind of changes in the way we, we live, our, live our lives and do our shopping and, and everything else. Um, something may well have worked well in the past. And I hope in my remarks I didn't um, discredit the RPI over many generations. I know many people here have, have worked on in, in years gone by. Each generation has tried to produce the best family of prices for the, for the time. Um, and the fact that we see the problems we've described today doesn't mean they've always been there. But we need to remind ourselves that things change and um, rest on today's empirical arguments rather than yesterday's ones, which, which just may no longer hold. So... I think those are my real reflections on this. Um, I think it is a critical debate. We have got uh, the House of Lords inquiry is continuing. Our research agenda is continuing. We are particularly continuing to work on the household cost index, which several people have been encouraged to give us a real properly rigorously grounded fix on how prices are impacting on, on households. Uh, RPI, we can't act alone. I mean, we've all might said in different ways why we don't think the current thing is a good thing. Um, but um, management of expectations in this space is, is really important. There are, as everybody said, billions of pounds at stake, um, and it matters we get it, get it right. Um, so we will take extreme care. But I just finished by being reiterating my gratitude to the society for organising this. I think you've done a super job at getting a really wide range of views into this space. I think it's good for people to hear each other's views because there are different perspectives, which may give you a little bit of insight into the challenge of my job of trying to reconcile them into something we can all kind of um, uh, work around. And what I hope is, as we go forward, the spirit that's been shown in this room of being really straightforward with each other but also supportive of trying to work through something which is really pretty hard and matters, I think is one that I, I celebrate. And uh, I thank you for that. And thank you again for a great evening. Um, OK, so I hope you agree. Um, that's been a fantastic and uh, enjoyable, certainly uh, for me, I'm sure for you, and uh, hopefully important meeting. Uh, clearly, part of the purpose of the Royal Statistical Society is to encourage debate, communication, dissemination of statistics, and so we're extremely pleased to host this meeting, and I'd like to thank members of the NSAG of the RSS for doing almost, well, doing all of the work for this, and also the local RSS team for um, helping us put on the event this evening. So thank you very much to all of you for coming and making the meeting, and also for those speakers that spoke. Um, please send us something written if you haven't done already. Um, and also, please join us for drinks and refreshments and hopefully further discussion um, after this meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah.